Welcome to the River Center for our virtual field trip today. And today we're going to talk all about reptiles. But first, I want to know how you guys actually feel about reptiles. So behind me are different images, and I'm going to show you some different pictures. And what I want you guys to do is point to however you feel based on my pictures. Okay? There's no right answer. All right, you ready? Picture one. This is a green anole. How do you guys feel about that? Why do you feel that way? All right, picture two. <laughs> this is our American alligator. How do you guys feel? What do you already know about this animal? Picture three. <laughs> this is our green sea turtle. Hmm. What would you like to find out about this animal? All right, picture four. <laughs> this is our diamondback rattlesnake. Hmm. Why do you feel that way? All right, last one, picture five. This is our gopher tortoise. What do you already know about this animal? What would you like to learn? People respond differently to different animals. Our response to some animal species can depend on our personality, our life experiences, and how we grew up. During this field trip, we're going to see whether your reaction changes when you learn more about the animal. All of these animals that we're gonna to see today have something in common. They're all reptiles, they're all native to Florida, and are all found in and around the Loxahatchee River. Let's learn a little bit more about what a reptile really is. Hey everybody, my name is Sam, and today we're gonna to learn about reptiles. Reptiles are air-breathing vertebrates covered in scales, bony plates, or a combination of both. They include crocodiles, snakes, lizards, turtles, and tortoises. Almost all reptiles are cold-blooded and most lay eggs. Instead of having gills like fish or amphibians, reptiles have lungs for breathing air. Most regularly shed the outer layer of their skin. Their whole body depends on temperature. So the temperature of their environment determines the temperature of their body. Unlike birds and mammals, reptiles do not maintain a constant body temperature inside, like we do. Without fur or feathers for insulation, they cannot stay warm on a cold day. And without sweat glands or the ability to pant, they cannot cool off on a hot day either. Instead, they move into the sun or into the shade as needed. During the cooler parts of the year, they hibernate. Reptiles have a slow metabolism and a heat-seeking behavior, and this is because they are cold-blooded. Most reptiles lay eggs in simple nests made out of leaves. The young hatch days to months later, and newborn reptiles can walk, glide, and swim within hours of birth. What are some common reptiles you'll find around your area? Well, in South Florida and around the Loxahatchee River, some reptiles that we see the most are alligators, snakes, turtles, lizards, and tortoises that live around the fresh water or on land. We have sea turtles, crocodiles, iguanas, and other reptiles that live in brackish or saltwater habitats. We also have native, exotic and invasive species of reptiles in Florida. Native species are species that are from Florida. They've lived here their whole life. They'll hopefully always live here. This is their home. 
exotic species are species that are not from Florida, but they've been brought into Florida and introduced into our ecosystems. And invasive species are species that are not from Florida, from other places that have been brought over here that are now taking over ecosystems and out competing our native species for food and homes. We don't like our invasive species. Some of them, our most common invasive exotic reptiles here in South Florida include the iguana, our Cuban anole, our Burmese python, and our African agama. Now that you have some more facts and information about these animals, how do you feel about them? Let's discover some real living reptiles that are found in habitats all around the Loxahatchee River. Hi there, my name is Megan and today we are going to highlight four main reptiles whose habitats are found along the Loxahatchee River. This is a yellow-bellied slider. It's a freshwater turtle and it's special because the river is named after these guys. So Loxahatchee is a seminal word meaning river of turtle or turtle river. So let's get up close and make some observations. Hmm, I wonder, what are some things that you notice? Is there anything that this turtle reminds you of? Well, some of the things that I wonder is, I wonder how they can see underwater. So turtles have well-developed sight, but they actually lack peripheral vision. They have an upper and a lower eyelid, and a third eyelid that is just a thin membrane called a nictitating membrane that helps them see underwater. So think of it like your snorkel goggles. I also wonder how turtles can breathe for so long underwater. Well, turtles have lungs and they have to breathe above the water. So one of the adaptations that they have is the ability to hold their breath for a pretty long time. Depending on their activities, this turtle can hold its breath for 20 to 30 minutes. So why would they need to hold their breath for so long? Well, down underwater is where they can hide from predators. It's where they can find their food. And it's also where they can maybe rest underneath a rock or a branch so that's why you would need to hold your breath for so long. So this is another older yellow-bellied slider. And something that I notice about him is that he has claws in the front and webbed feet in the back. So their claws are used for climbing while their back feet are to help them swim. They spend most of their lives in the water, but will crawl back out uh, onto land to bask and to warm themselves up, sometimes to escape predators, and the females will come out to lay their eggs. I noticed that this turtle and all turtles have shells. The turtle shell is a natural part of its body and it's made out of flat, hard plates called scoops. The plates are connected to the body by their ribs and shoulders, so it can't take its shell off and find a new one. The shell is valuable for protection against predators. And if you were to visit an aquarium or a nature center or had a friend with a pet turtle, then you might actually get a chance to touch a turtle shell. Now, their skin is quite leathery and it's very sensitive. So they can feel my hand on its shell because they have a series of nerves underneath their surface. So this turtle reminds me of sea turtles that live in the ocean. How amazing that we live in a place where we can see both freshwater turtles and sea turtles. Some of the differences though are that freshwater turtles have arms while sea turtles have flippers. Well the freshwater turtle will go in and out of the water throughout their whole lives while sea turtles will swim in the ocean for their whole lives. What is the only reason a female sea turtle will come out of the ocean and go onto the beach? That's right, to lay their eggs. Another difference between freshwater turtles and sea turtles are their life expectancy. 
or how long they live. It's tough to be a turtle, especially if you're a hatchling, because anything bigger than you wants to eat you. Now, if turtles, any turtles, can make it to adulthood, these freshwater turtles can live between 20 and 30 years, but a sea turtle can live 80 to 100 years. This turtle reminds me of one time when I kayaked down the Loxahatchee River and I saw a whole bunch of turtles sunning themselves on a log. So these turtles are important to freshwater habitats because they're an important part of the food chain. Turtles are food for alligators, birds, snakes, and even fish, depending on what size they are. These turtles are omnivores, which means that they eat both plants and animals. They can eat small fish and insects, invertebrates, and decaying plants and animals too. So share with us what else you notice and wonder about this special animal. train Cyprus so that he can be our educational partner. Well, I'm going to show you a little bit about how we do that. So we need to get him out of our exhibit here. This is the, flood, the floodplains exhibit at the River Center. And he's in here with his little turtle friends. We've got two yellow-bellied slider and a snapping turtle as well. But we need to be able to get him out and we want to do that as safely as possible and to make it as less stressful for him as possible as well. So we've been using some different types of training. We give him a visual signal as well as an audible signal to let him know that it's time to get food. And once he gets food, he knows that he's going to get picked up and then we can use him as our educational partner. So the tools that we use are, the visual signal is a target and I did attach the GoPro so that you can get some a good view of how he actually comes up to the target, but he knows that he needs to touch this blue target with his nose. Once he does that, I give him an audible signal with my whistle that lets him know that food is coming. And because we've conditioned him this way, every time that we want him to come out of the water, we will give him a visual and an audible cue and he will he will move into position so that we can take him out of the aquarium. So, hopefully this goes the way that it's supposed to go. Of course, animals can have good days and bad days, so we'll see how he's feeling today. So it turns out that attaching the camera to the target was really upsetting to Cyprus. So we're going to try it the way we normally do it every day. I was hoping we could get you some cool footage, but that's not going to work out. So we're going to try it again and uh, see if he's okay with just the regular target. Here we go.
ready? Good boy. All right, I think he's ready now. So we're ready to talk about our next reptile of the Loxahatchee. It is an apex predator of the swamp, and that is the American alligator. This is Cyprus, and he was born in captivity at Gatorland in Orlando. We brought Cyprus to the River Center in 2019. He is a male gator, and he's about a year and a half old right now. With the permission of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, he is an ambassador for his species and an educational partner with us to show you how alligators are eco-enrichers in our freshwater habitats. So we're gonna think like scientists and we're going to get up close and make some observations. We're gonna use three prompts. I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. I notice that you can see some of his teeth. Alligators have broad and rounded snouts. Because an alligator's lower jaw is slightly smaller than its upper jaw, its lower teeth are hidden when it closes its mouth. You can kind of see that here. Right? You can see how the lower jaw is smaller and fits underneath the upper jaw, so only the upper teeth are showing. When an alligator flashes his closed mouth smile, all you can see are his downward pointing top teeth. Crocodiles have toothier smiles, since both jaws are roughly the same size. Their upper and lower teeth interlock when they shut their mouths, giving you an eyeful of both upper and lower teeth. Another easy way to see the difference between alligators and crocodiles, crocodiles have a very pointy snout, whereas the alligator snout is nice and rounded. I wonder, what do you wonder? Well, I think I wonder how long he will get when he's an adult. Male alligators are usually larger than females, and the average length for an American male alligator is 11 feet long. It reminds me of, is there something about Cyprus that reminds you of something else? Hmm, well, the black and yellow pattern on his tail reminds me of a pattern I might see on a snake. Adult alligators are primarily dark gray in color with a lighter color underside. Although juvenile alligators will have a light colored stripe on their sides. I wonder why he has these stripes. Hmm, what do you think? Well, these stripes help him to camouflage. While alligators are an apex predator, when they are this size, they are still vulnerable to predation themselves. So little alligators must camouflage themselves in the grasses, that's why he has stripes, to help protect himself and hide from other predators. So the American alligator is federally protected by the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. And this is due to the fact that it is similar in um, appearance to the American crocodile. Remember, never feed an alligator. And if you see one, keep your distance. Alligators and crocodiles are an important part of our aquatic ecosystems here in Florida and also part of our natural and cultural history. Alligators play an important role in maintaining our ecosystem balance as an apex predator. So what do I mean by apex predator? Well, alligators are sitting at the top of the food chain and they help to keep other animal populations in balance. By digging holes and leaving trails through the marshes, they create habitats for fish and marine invertebrates. The more we understand the importance of alligators and how to live alongside these 
incredible animals, the more we can appreciate and learn from them, dispel fears, and be proud of Florida's state reptile. Now, not all reptiles live in and around the water. We can find all sorts of reptiles in the upland habitats of Florida too. Animals like the Florida pine snake like to live in the open canopy of the pine flatwoods. The Florida scrub lizard lives in fire maintained communities with deep sand like the sand pine and coastal scrub. And the gopher tortoise digs their burrows in sandy soil of the oak hammock in the dry prairies. Reptiles that live in upland communities have different adaptations and characteristics that allow them to survive there. So here are two more reptiles that call the Loxahatchee River watershed their home. So the animal that I'd like to share with you today is an animal that many people have some different feelings on. This is Daisy. She's one of our corn snakes here at the River Center. Um, she is a female and corn snakes are often called red rat snakes. Okay, so let's get up close and make some observations. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Hmm. I notice that her pupils and her eyes are round. The eyes of venomous snakes have vertical elliptical pupils that remind me kind of like a cat. Non-venomous snakes, like Daisy here, have round pupils, kind of like humans. The only exception is a coral snake, which we might see a coral snake a little bit later. Corn snakes are non-venomous and harmless to people and are primarily active at night. I wonder, do snakes have eyelids? They actually don't, which is why sometimes people think that snakes are staring at them. Instead, they have something called a brill attached to each eye. A brill is also known as an ocular scale or eye cap. The brill protects the snake's eyes from dust and dirt and gives them a glassy eyed appearance. I also notice her coloration, right? She's got orange and brown and red and black. She's all different colors. There's also a spear-shaped pattern on her head and neck. And then the belly has a black and white checkerboard pattern. It reminds me of keys on a keyboard. <laughs> I wonder where a snake like this would live out in the wild. Eastern corn snakes are commonly found in pinelands, hardwood hammocks, swamps, agricultural fields, and residential areas. Corn snakes are both a burrower and a climber. They like to burrow deep in under the ground or sometimes even in leaf litter. And they're really, really good climbers. They like to hang out in trees and palm fronds and under rocks and logs too. I wonder though, why are they called corn snakes? The name corn snake actually comes from the days when southern farmers stored harvested ears of corn in a wood frame or log building called a crib. Rats and mice came to feed on the corn in the corn crib and corn snakes came in to feed on the rats and mice. Normally in the wild too, these snakes like to feed on lizards, frogs, other rodents, and birds. It's hard to imagine a better man-made habitat with raptors and logs on which these snakes could climb and hide. And they were paid for using it by eating those pesky rodents. So the next time you actually see a snake, make sure to thank it. Thanks, Daisy. <laughs> so before we put Daisy back in her home, we actually just noticed that she shed. So let me pull it out and show you guys. Now normally when snakes shed, it's kind of soft, almost wet. So it does tend to clump up like this but eventually you can stretch it out. And we use this to measure how big she's gotten.
this is going to be our last reptile friend that we meet today. And you'll notice he doesn't have any legs, but he is a lizard. I wonder how he moves. What does he remind you of? Well, he kind of looks like a snake, but he's called a glass or legless lizard. And he is a lizard, not a snake. And we can tell by a couple different reasons. First off, the most noticeable thing, if we look at his eyes, you'll notice he has eyelids, like the majority of lizards do. Snakes don't have eyelids. He also has what we call a fused jaw, and that means that like our jaw, it can only open to a certain amount, whereas a snake has a very flexible jaw, and they can open their jaws sometimes up to two times the size of their regular mouth. And they do that so they can eat food. But our legless lizard, he can't do that. He also has scales that are the same size all the way around his body, whereas our snakes have bigger scales on their belly that help them move. And you'll see that our glass lizard, he doesn't have that. Instead, he has this big plate right here. So he actually doesn't move as effectively or efficiently as our snakes do. And we wouldn't find them in the same environment either. Our snakes, they love to be in trees. They'll burrow sometimes, and they'll also slither on the land. But our legless lizard, he likes to burrow. And that's why they don't have legs, because their legs and arms just got in their way of tunneling as they were burrowing in the sand. If you look at his face, you'll notice he's got this nice pointed shovel-like head, and that's what he uses to burrow in the sand. He uses his face to push that sand out of the way so he can get where he's going. So my glass lizard's name is Kevin. And if we look at Kevin's color, it's kind of sandy, a little brown. And that's also an indicator of where we might find him and what habitat we will see him in. These guys like to be on the beach, in the sand dunes, in those scrubby, sandy habitats where they can camouflage in and burrow in the sand. These guys like to eat very small insects, tiny little baby rodents, anything that they can fit inside their fused jaw. People will also refer to them as glass lizards, and that's because they have a tendency to drop their tail. But unlike other lizards, when they drop their tail, it shatters like glass. And it's a very interesting thing to watch. Now, we're not going to provoke him to do that because nobody wants to have to lose a limb if they don't need to. But in case he is attacked by predators, our glass lizard, he can drop his tail and leave it as a sacrifice for predators so that he can get away. And then he'll slowly regrow his new tail in his own time. All creatures are important to the circle of life, and Kevin is too. He's got a very important role in his scrub habitats. These are burrowing lizards. So as they're burrowing and creating tunnels, they're able to share those tunnels with some other small creatures. But more than anything, they're also aerating the soil, and they're putting space where oxygen can get amongst the roots of all the plants and help keep those plants very alive. They're also a food source for lots of other things, not to mention that Kevin himself will eat small pest insects and very small pest rodents as well. So all the way around, he is a good part of the ecosystem and he helps keep the ecosystem in balance too and keeps the soil profile nice and healthy for all of our lovely plants. The Loxahatchee River District protects the river through wastewater treatment solutions. When we as a community protect the river from pollution entering our water resources, we are protecting reptile habitats. Reptiles are some of the most iconic symbols of this special river. We want them to continue to be ambassadors of the Loxahatchee for future generations. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed experiencing some of the fascinating reptiles that are found in the Loxahatchee River. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, or you can send an email to 
education at lrecd.org. Take a look at our other short education videos on the River Center's YouTube page. We look forward to seeing you on our next virtual field trip, which will be a fish morphology lesson on Wednesday, November 4th at 10 a.m. Say bye-bye, Cypress. Bye-bye.